Uh, yeah, so today I'll be talking about this topic that's quite a challenge to us when it presents one that doesn't have a great natural history for us to follow and treat. So I'll be discussing hemorrhagic cystitis. Special thanks to Dr. Black who reviewed the slides and gave me some feedback on my presentation. So my goal for today is to discuss the most common causes of hemorrhagic cystitis and particularly the pathophysiology behind these causes. But the bulk of my talk, I want to focus on the management options and basically, hopefully by the end of the talk, come up with a loose algorithm of what we can follow when we have these patients that come in with very challenging presentations. And so hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, we'll have an idea of exactly, well, some kind of an idea of what we should do when these patients present. So loosely termed, hemorrhagic cystitis is the endpoint of any pathologic etiology that can cause damage to the bladder and bleeding from the mucosa. Hematuria is typically pre present as is stated in the name, but uh, other symptoms can be present as well. A lot of these patients can present with lower urinary tract symptoms, frequency, urgency, dysuria. And this is a familiar look when we go in with a with the camera. This is what we see in a, a diffuse erythemic area with telangiectasis. So this is very familiar to a lot of us who have gone in and uh, assessed these patients. You can see from the table, lots of things can cause it. Uh, I'm not gonna have time to go through all the all of them, but uh, I'm gonna touch on the most common ones that we come across uh, with the patients that uh, present to us when we get consulted. So bacterial fungal infection, rarely do they cause a true long-term hemorrhagic cystitis presentation. Most of them present with microscopic hematuria, but it's still important to know when somebody comes in with hematuria that infection is always on our differential. E. coli being the most prevalent with a bacterial infection, but again, most commonly they present with microscopic hematuria. The key for fungal infections is oftentimes these patients present with urinary tract infections and we can't see anything in the cultures. We just got to be cognizant of the fact that a specific urine sample has to be sent to look for fungal growth. So if you have infective sources or presentations of uh, what you think may be a urinary tract infection and they have hematuria, just make sure that we're ruling out a fungal infection uh, in the presentation with Canada being the most common uh, fungi. Now, schistosomiasis. This is real. We saw it at Children's two weeks ago. It's not just in Egypt, uh, but rarely seen in North America. Uh, basically, the larvae uh, go through your skin, penetrate the skin, and eventually get into the bladder wall after they enter the bladder muscle through the veins of the pelvis. Untreated long-term infections can lead to uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, so it's very important to know when this infection actually does happen. Uh, generally speaking, the reason we get patients that have hematuria is uh, the ova is excreted into the urine. They get mucosal hyperplasia, dysplasia, and that results in bleeding along with formation of potential bladder stones. So it's actually kind of exciting that we saw it a couple weeks ago. A real deal patient. The patient had intermittent hematuria for a couple months and she was eight years old at children and she didn't tell anybody about it until mom figured it out. And so then the whole family got worked up. Two of the daughters had it. The mom has it. So it was a whole shebang. They went swimming in Lake Malawi in Africa. With respect to viral infections, so the adenovirus is can be a culprit when it comes to hemorrhagic uh, cystitis, particularly type 11. And in the 1970s, they actually saw quite a few healthy Japanese and American children who developed uh, hemorrhagic cystitis, and they were found to have adenovirus. But it's also implicated in bone marrow and uh, organ transplant patients. You can also see um, the types 7, 21, and 35 that are typically implicated for uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. More commonly, what we can get called about is a BK virus, which is a polyomavirus, and uh, it's a relative of JC virus. And generally, the e JC virus was the etiology of a progressive multifocal uh, leukinocephalopathy that was seen in 1971 in patients, in transplant patients. And typically, it presents asymptomatic, it's latent, but it resides in uroepithelial cells and gets reactivated in immunodeficient states. So, HIV infection, or more commonly what we get called about transplant patients that are immunosuppressions. And BK viruria typically happens in about 50% of patients, 50% uh, of BMT patients, two months after stem cell transplant. So uh, not all of them develop hemorrhagic cystitis. It's thought to, uh, the, some of the thought processes that they have a significantly high viral load that can contribute to the fact that they can develop this. Um, we typically see less and less of these presentations these days is because when they present, typically they're self-resolving, they can present quite dramatically, but in a couple of weeks with supportive therapy with IV fluids, CBI, they resolve. But they're also given a trifecta of medications. Fluoroquinolones is one medication they found to have some uh, benefit as it, uh, it inhibits the helicase activating bacteria, but it also inhibits the large T antigen, which is similar to the DNA gyrase in the bacteria. They also give them uh, leflunamide, which 
that has an immunosuppressive activity and along with a sedativivir, which is an acyclic nucleoside analog, which they found to be active against this virus. So this trifecta has helped treat these presentations, and so we see less of it these days than we did previously. Uh, Oxazophosphorin agents, cyclophosphamide, diphosphamide are the most common among them that we get called that we can get called about uh, for hemorrhagic cystitis. So these drugs were amongst the first anti-cancer drugs that were used in the 50s. Still today, commonly used in solid and stem cell cancers, but also many non-cancerous uh, presentations. Patients with nephritic syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, polyarteritis nodosa, Crohn's. All these patients can be treated with these medications. Um, so it is still commonly used. Patients typically present with frequency, urgency, dysuria, microscopic or gross hematuria, and sometimes this hematuria can truly become a hemorrhagic size picture as it won't stop. And it's not actually the, the drugs directly that are causing this. Well, after the drugs are metabolized, uh, the metabolite acrolein is produced, which is filtered by the kidneys and concentrated by the bladder. And all the urothelium can uh, theoretically be affected, but because the urine gets concentrated in the bladder, typically that's where we see the effect. And the incidence is typically higher in the IV route rather than the oral route uh, when given. So how does acrolein work? Basically, acrolein is a reactive unsaturated aldehyde. It, upregul it upregulates the reactive oxygen species, results in production of nitric oxide, and produces peroxynitrites, which attack lipids and other macromolecules, such as proteins, cause DNA strands to break, and results in overactivity of DNA repair enzyme, PARP, which depletes intracellular ATP, leading to necrosis. Furthermore, uh, reactive oxygen species allow the nuclear factor B to enter the nucleus, and this results in activation of transcription genes, which result in pro-inflammatory cytokines such as tumor necrosis factors, uh, alpha, uh, interleukin-11, and generally this results in protein production seizing, urothelium into integrity being damaged, and changes to bladder mucosa such as bleeding, swelling, ulceration that we can see in these patients. You typically can see edema and hyperemia within four hours of administration, but after just one dose, you can see these effects up to 36 hours afterward as well. And what they found typically for treatment is the best treatment is prevention. And they actually tried uh, N-acetylcysteine first, which bound to the carbon-carbon double bond of acrolein. They found it was uroprotective, but it kind of diminished the whole purpose of the drug, which was the neoplastic effect. So they went to something else, and they found Mesna in 1984 in the U.S., and basically what Mesna does is, is oxidize uh, to an inactive stable disulfide in the serum, but it's reactivating the kidney, binds to acrolein, and creates an inert thioether that is excreted. Now, the half-life of uh, Mesna is about 90 minutes, whereas cyclophosphamide and phosphamide is about 6 to 7 hours, so redosing is necessary with Mesna, and it's also important to make sure that the Mesna is actually present before the drugs are given for it to be effective. They did a double-blind study by Foucault-Croix in 1991 when they compared Mesna to a placebo for ifofosamide patients, and they found significant, statistically significant reduction in development of radiation cystitis. So it, it has been proven to work. And the other me preventative me measure is hyperhydration and diuresis, which they found can also help prevent uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. They've compared Mesna to, the, to hyperhydration, just a small, small series that say maybe Mesna is better in one, hyperhydration may be better in the other, but realistically, practically, they're both kind of used for patients that are getting these drugs to reduce the likelihood of developing hemorrhagic cystitis. So for practicalities at our BMP center, are they just doing hyperhydration? They do Mesna too. They, I know that there was, I recall at Children's, actually, a couple months ago, a patient that had cyclophosphamide-induced uh, hemorrhagic cystitis, and they had been given Mesna and hyperhydration. So. It, it, theirs was short lasting, though it only lasted three, four days, fortunately. And I think that also has been shown to reduce if you get the immaturia, you have it for less period of time than you would if you hadn't been exposed to it. So, this is generally the bane of our resist, uh, existence the radiation induced hemorrhagic cystitis. And we know radiation therapy is a common option for a lot of pelvic cancers, not just urologic, but also uh, cervical, rectal cancers. And a lot of these patients are so, uh, present with associate, with irritated voiding symptoms. Uh, they come with urgency, frequency, dysuria. And uh, it can happen really any time after they're treated, whether it's acutely or months to years after. And I'll get to some of the data about how long it can come in afterwards. And depending on which uh, data series you look, it could be as low as 2% of patients that get affected, to as high as 47%. So it, there's no real concrete number of how many patients get affected by it. And the level of complications varies with no real natural history. 
And it is truly multifactorial in nature, but we know it's also dose dependent as well. And we've seen advances in delivery of radiation, such as conformal radiation therapy, intensity modulated RT, brachytherapy. These typically result in less likelihood of developing radiation induced hemorrhagic cystitis, but it's still not impossible. And it's believed to be related to irreparable cellular DNA damage, not necessarily. Uh, direct damage, but at the indirect when free radicals are created by the ionization of intracellular water that do the damage. And for perspective, a normal epithelium, we have a lining that's composed of three to seven uh, layers of transitional cells, which are resting in the basement membrane, which is composed of extracellular matrix. Uh, the epithelium consists of actively proliferating cells, uh, while luminal cells are large and bound via tight junctions. Uh, the surface co is covered by glycosaminic glycans, which function as a defense mechanism, uh, given that they uh, act as a permeability barrier and prevent uh, attachment of a variety of substances and bacteria. But what happens in radiation is we know that radiation loves to attack cells that are actively dividing. It doesn't work very well and quickly on cells that are in a resting stage, or the G0 stage, if you remember from the cy cell cycle days. Um, so we know that mucosa is sensitive to radiation because there's rapid cell division. And uh, in, in acute injury, you lo get loss of those tight junctions. Underlying tissue is exposed to hypertonic urine. Results in increase in immature atypical cells. And that's when patients typically present with lower urinary tract symptoms. At about three months, we can see intermediate basal urethral cells that show nuclear irregularity, cellular edema, increased cytoplasmic elements. At about six to 12 months, there's increased urethral proliferative activity, increased fibrosis and ischemia. And the ischemia can impact the urethelium, the smooth, smooth uh, muscle of the bladder, which leads to decreased compliance and, uh, and the smooth muscle is essentially replaced by fibrosis. And the late toxicity that sustained uh, uh, injuries to semivascular endothelial cells and connective tissues at the time of treatment can result in submucosal fibrosis inflammation, further ischemia, necrosis, ulceration, and neovascularization, which gives rise to these superficial, fragile vessels that are truly responsible for the hemorrhagic uh, cystitis picture. Typically, you can have two kind of presentations, acute and late onset. Acute is typically signs or symptoms during or shortly uh, following treatment. And they typ typically self-resolve within three months after radiation is stopped. Treatment is generally supported. You can give anticholinergics for frequency and irritative symptoms. Uh, you can give uh, phenazopyridine for uh, pain and discomfort. And again, they're typically self-resolving, but it's more so the late set ones that cause, uh, cause issues for us. And Levenbach and colleagues in 1994 looked at uh, 1,800 patients who underwent radiation therapy for cervical cancer, and they found over the time uh, period that uh, 116 patients had developed hemorrhagic cystitis, so about uh, just under 10% of patients had developed it. And they found that the median time to the initial occurrence was about 35 and a half months, whereas the mean was about 58 months. So what they also did is they did a long-term analysis, actu actuarial life analysis, to see what the likelihood of developing hemorrhagic cystitis is. And they saw that it's about 5.8% uh, at 5 years, 74 at 10 years, and about 9.6% at 20 years. So this isn't something that if you surpass a certain year, you're safe from getting. This can come on very late, and uh, certainly we see it in this paper. Is that external beam radiation or that's uh, They underwent, it was a variety of radiation for these ones. It just uh, External beam and intracavitary treatments, that's what the two words they use. Now, it's important to uh, know what we mean when we discuss hemorrhagic cystitis with respect to its grading. There's multiple different things in literature, multiple different ways of classifying it, but commonly they use this classification, which is the EORTC, RTOG classification. Um, and that's the one that I'm going to talk about very often today. And typically when these patients present to us, I would say they're typically around a three to four range. Sometimes we're lucky and they come in the... Uh, grade two and maybe CBI quickly gets that gets the situation fixed, but unfortunately, it feels like lately we've had more three and four uh, present, which can be quite challenging. So that's what? For the, that's for the hospital patient. Yeah. For the office patient, it's one and two. One and two. Yeah, the ones that we can't fix <laughs> seemingly is usually three and four, or have a difficult time fixing is three and four. So what do we do when these patients come in? So. Back to the basics, we should make sure we do a full his, uh, history and physical, make sure we know when the last time they had radiation was, if they in fact had radiation. Do the basic lab uh, investigation, CBC, coagulation studies, do your analysis, culture, cytology, imaging. So as with any hematuria presentation, it would serve us well to make sure that there's no new uh, potential malignancy and to, to rule out uh, anything in the upper tract, to so do a dedicated CT urogram if available or an ultrasound. 
and these patients have had radiation, so they have an increased risk of developing cancer and cystoscopy. So I'm going to talk about this uh, very shortly about how cystoscopy can be diagnostic and therapeutic. And basically, we want to see, do clot evacuation, but we also want to see if there's any new malignant lesions that to perhaps these patients are presenting with. And sometimes you just see erythema, telangiectasis, ulceration that confirms your radiation due to hemorrhagic cystitis right off the bat. So diagnostic uh, cystoscopy. Leakman and colleagues in uh, 2014 looked at uh, 2,500 men that underwent radiation therapy over a couple of decades, and 185 of them underwent cystoscopy for various reasons, 114 of them for gross hematuria, 3 for microscopic, and 68 uh, for persistent LUTs. These patients had brachytherapy plus or minus EBRT. And uh, what they found was two-thirds of the patients had normal finding on cystoscopy, but 18 of them had a new bladder tumor. So about 10% of the patients had a new bladder tumor. Interestingly enough, seven of them was just from lower urinary tract symptoms, whereas 11 was from uh, gross hematuria. No tumors were seen from the microscopic hematuria group. And uh, 13 out of the 185 had pathologic confirmation of radiation cystitis. 18 had inflammation. Uh, or pardon me, seven had inflammation. 18 had hypervascularity. So you make the argument that more than just the 13 had radiation cystitis when you see the hypervascularity, evidence of inflammation. But that's not an insignificant number of people who actually had a brand new tumor just from, the, from their presentation. So something to keep in mind that it can be quite diagnostic to do a cystoscopy early on when these when patients present. Now, from a therapeutic perspective, this was a case series to assess the effectiveness of cystoscopy and clot evacuation for patients that present in uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. This was a study looked at uh, by Kaplan and Wolf Jr. And uh, basically, they looked at 33 patients who underwent uh, cystoscopy over a decade, 17 of which were cyclophosphamide-induced, 15 radiation. And they found complete resolution after cystoscopy, clot evacuation, and fulguration in 14 patients. 20 patients showed uh, resolution, but 14 of them was purely from cystoscopy and clot evacuation and fulguration only. Six of them had formula and silver nitrite also instilled. 13 showed no resolution of the 13. 11 had a repeat cystoscopy with, again, only 36% uh, having resolution. So it seems like if you do the cystoscopy, there is a decent chance you can get some form of resolution. So it almost serves us well to go early and at least know whether it's going to be effective or if we need to go to more aggressive treatment right off the bat rather than just waiting and hoping that the CVI clears everything up early on. So this is the recommendation from the CUAJ best practice when it comes to cystoscopies, and they mentioned uh, assessment of the patient complaining of hematuria post-radiation should identify or exclude other pathologic factors that may explain or contribute to patient symptoms, and that patients with hematuria should undergo at least one initial cystoscopy with or without fulguration of suspected lesions and biopsy, any lesion concerning for malignancy for diagnostic therapeutic purposes. Now, what happens with these patients that have persistent and recurrent clinically significant hematuria? And this is where we get to the intravesical agents. And alum irrigation is one that we use very often. And essentially, they're aluminum ammonium sulfate or aluminum potassium sulfate or intravesical aluminum salts that act as constricting agents that precipitate proteins, resulting in decreased capillary permeability, contraction of intracellular spaces, vasoconstriction, and strengthening the capillary endothelium. And just generally, it serves to function as reducing edema, inflammation, and exudates, not particularly specific to any form of etiology that's causing the hemorrhagic cystitis. Works best with the bladder empty of clots, most common side effect being bladder spasms, suprapubic discomfort. We often see that these patients uh, clotting their catheters even when they have an empty uh, bladder with no clots. So it's very important to make sure that we actually uh, empty them without clots as, soon as uh, best as we can which is where the cystoscopy and clot evacuation can be quite effective. Now, also keep in mind with these patients that if they have a kidney failure, they have an increased risk of developing increased aluminum levels in their blood. So some things to keep in mind if your patient develops confusion, becomes lethargic, lab works with metabolic acidosis, hypercalcemia, iron-resistant microcyclinemia, to consider that as part of the differential. Generally, it's a 1% concentrate of alum that's mixed with sterile water. We run it about 250 to 300 cc's an hour. And duration, this isn't a very uh, great answer. How long should you use alum for? There's nothing in the literature that says you should use it for X amount of times. Unfortunately, it's at the discretion of us to decide what the best, thing, best uh, timeline is. There is one study that I'm going to talk about that <clears throat> their median time used was two days with some patients requiring pardon me, requiring five days of treatment, but I would say if after four or five days, if you haven't seen any treatment, it's probably not going to be effective. And this is a study in Westerman <clears throat> who looked at uh, 40 patients who had hemorrhagic cystitis that failed to respond to CBI. 38 of them were from radiation cystitis. And um, 
Furthermore, of the 40, 31 failed clot evacuation, three failed amicar, and they actually, one patient had silver nitrate, one had formulin, one had completed a course of hyperbaric suit, which I'll touch on shortly. But they underwent alum irrigation. 32 uh, re required blood transfusions 30 days prior to the alum, with a median number of units being four. Now, what they found was after they instilled about 1% of alum with a rate of 250 to uh, 300 cc's an hour, the most adverse event that they saw was bladder spasms, and 14 out of the 15 patients that had adverse event, uh, events had bladder spasms. Uh, 23 still required blood transfusion uh, 30 days after treatment, but the median number dropped to 3 compared to 4. 24 patients, 60% required no further treatment before uh, or beyond alum before discharge, and when they looked at these patients 16 months later and, and the median follow-up time, 13 required no treatments at all. So not perfect numbers, but for something that's fairly safe and fairly easy to give, 13 patients just recovered pretty quickly uh, from the alum. And again, the median time was two days of uh, alum uh, administration with five patients getting uh, five days of alum. So the best practice, a recommendation of alum is practical, easily applied for radiation, uh, radiation induced hemorrhagic cystitis. But again, this can apply to not just radiation induced hemorrhagic cystitis. Uh, with a comparatively acute onset of action that's generally well toler tolerated, special caution to be used with patients with poor renal function, as I mentioned, they can have uh, increased levels of aluminum. So hyaluronic acid, uh, major uh, mucopolysaccharide with immunomodulated properties that enhance uh, connective tissue healing. Uh, they be they're believed to mediate the GAG layer that's damaged by the radiation, and they're commonly used in interstitial cystitis and painful bladder syndrome. There's not a lot of da data for hemorrhagic cystitis, but the ones that are available are actually quite reassuring. This was a study by Bacillus, and that's not a misspelling, there is three straight S's. Uh, they looked at grade two to three radiation cystitis patients with no evidence of ulcers, and these patients, it was actually quite an amazing study. There was a prospective analysis of 20 patients at the University of Athens, and they looked at these patients and assessed them clinically. And after treatment uh, completion, they looked at the radiation oncologist, looked at them every three months for two years. Cystoscopy was performed three months before and three months after treatment by two different urologists. Uh, intravesical administration was given to these patients that were in bed rest for at least one hour while they were administered. And they were administered once a week for four weeks, then monthly for two months for a total of three months. So definitely not a quick fix. It was a long period that they looked at these patients. But what they just found was reassuring. They found that uh, Prior to installation, 70% of patients had grade 3 cystitis, uh, grade 2 was at 30%, but post-installation, grade 5, 45% uh, had grade 1, 55% grade 2, nobody had grade 3 anymore after the installation. This is one of the images that they posted for the before and after administration, and we can see um, basically what I just mentioned uh, summarized in the table and the graph. So hyaluronic acid, an option, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it used here, but uh, I believe it is available just because we can use it for other, uh, other uh, presentations. And what we've seen is the therapy may improve blood and may provide benefit for these patients that present, but uh, it's slow and there's lack of research for severe hematuria. <clears throat> One thing to note with these patients is that this is just grade 2, grade 3 presentations. We don't know what happens if they present with grade 4, grade 5. There's no data for it. Yeah. For this one? No, not for this one. There's not a lot of data with this. and. This is the best one that I could find with 20 patients that they looked at. There's a few different uh, intravesical agents that I'll briefly touch on. So Amicar, this is uh, uh, basically the mechanism behind it is it's supposed to stabilize the clotting process through inhibition of plasminogen activator inhibiting fibrinolysis. Again, not a lot of data. There's the best data that I can find is from Singh and colleagues in 1992 who looked at, uh, it was 37 patients who had failed the uh, cystoscopy clot evacuation, and they performed intravesical uh, administration of Amicar, and they actually found 34 out of 37 patients responded quite well. 13 out of the 14 were radiation-induced, but Amicar <coughs> isn't without its uh, side effects. It can present with nausea, diarrhea, hypotension, and you have an increased, develop, uh, increased likelihood of developing uh, thrombosis too, just because of the mechanism of the action. Silver nitrate, I've seen this used in a lot of different papers when they talked about it. But I couldn't actually find anything conclusive that says that it can be beneficial to any capacity. Um, there was a study done in 2016. Again, these studies are quite small, but, but in 2016, Montgomery looked at nine patients with refractory hemorrhagic cystitis who failed CBI Clodovac, and all nine failed after they tried silver nitrate on them. So I've seen it used for a few different uh, papers, and I've seen it as an option, but I, I couldn't really find any convincing data that it's actually effective in any, any manner.
Now, prostaglandins, they strengthen, the idea is they strengthen cell membranes, reduce edema, but you may also get local vasoconstriction, and smooth muscle contractility. Limited data, again, and it's quite expensive to get this <coughs> drug as well, but Levin in 1993 looked at 18 BMT patients post-cyclophosphamide uh, chemotherapy who developed hemorrhagic cystitis, and they were not responsive to CBI and forced diuresis, and they were given intravesical carboprost uh, tromethamine, which is an F2-alpha prostaglandin. They found that these patients, half of them responded, and, uh, but three of them had a recurrence, and from 9 of the 18 responded, 8 had partial uh, re response but needed further treatment. So some, some, uh, some good result, but again, very expensive and not very good data, if, uh, so I'm not sure if that's something that we should be recommending early on. So this is the next recommendation from the best practice. Several options are available, but they're trialed in limited case series. They truly do require further studies to assess as to whether they're uh, effective moving forward. <clears throat> so hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, radiation effects lead to hypoxia at the cellular level, ischemia and fibrosis, which result in very fragile blood vessels that are prone to re-bleeding. And this was first reported in 1985 by Weiss and colleagues. Average studies that you can find, the patients typically undergo 30, 40 daily sessions for about two hours while they inhale 100% oxygen. And the idea is hyperoxia promotes new vascularization of healthy vessels, and you get healthy granulation tissues from this. They induce vasoconstriction. They, they can mobilize stem cells. Most common effect, side effects being barotrauma, visual disturbance, claustrophobia, paresthesia. And they're used for a variety of different etiology. Uh, you can use it for acute sensory hearing loss, patients with diabetic foot, radiation proctitis, osteonecrosis of the jaw, uh, neck fash, fourniers after they've had the debridement, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. So it's used for multiple different uh, presentations. And there's a multiple studies that demonstrate the efficacy of treatment for hemorrhagic cystitis. But a prominent one that demonstrates the effects was done by Cardinal and colleagues in 2018, which is actually a meta-analysis of 16 studies so they looked at a total of 602 patients. The majority of the patients had radiation therapy due to prostate cancer, with EBRT being the most common. Of the 16, one of the studies was a randomized control. Two were prospective, 13 retrospective. Um, treatments were attempted that were attempted before the hyperbaric therapy for these patients were uh, CBI, electrocauterization, or actual electrocoagulation of the bladder, alum, prostaglandin, formulin. And mean atmospheric pressure for these studies was 2.4. Median number of sessions was 30, but it ranged from 20 to 62. What they found was out of the 602, quite a significant improved after hyperbarics. 84% had a partial or complete uh, resolution. Seven studies defined that partial or complete resolution using the EORTC criteria that I mentioned earlier. Um, three quarters of these patients saw at least one great improvement. Eight had uh, eight classified improvements based on patient symptom relief. And one was actually interesting was randomized comparing uh, HBO to hyaluronic acid. And they actually found at uh, the six month mark that. Uh, there was no statistical significance and benefit of hyaluronic acid and HBO, and they looked, followed these patients for 18 months and again found both had very good outcomes. So again, a point for hyaluronic acid potentially moving forward. Uh, they found that 14% of patients had recurrence, which actually isn't very significant compared to what I've just been discussing with other uh, treatment modalities that can result in recurrence. And the most common uh, complication was barotrauma followed by visual disturbance. About 6% of these patients had barotrauma, about 1% had visual disturbance. Now, what I want to highlight is the predictors of success. So the number of sessions was a predictor. The lower uh, RTOG, ERTC score, less than three. So ideally, if these patients are coming in before their symptoms are getting worse and they're getting referred to hyperbarics, that could be better for their outcome. Lower radiation dose, of course, younger patients. And hyperbarics start within six months of symptoms. So as soon as we make contact with these patients and we're worried that you know simple cystoscopy cloud evacuation won't work for them, maybe they don't respond to alum, I think get the consultation in this. And I know resources are tight to have this accom uh, accommodate all these patients, but I think that's something that we can better at. Whereas if we see this later, if the patients come in later, their effectiveness of the treatment isn't as high. Is that a, a meta analysis? Is the end point of treatment in those patients? They have 30, 30 to 60 treatments. Mm -hmm. Do they stop bleeding or they see? Resolution. They just wanted to see resolution. So basically, decreased bleeding, decreased symptomology. Both. They were looking at both. So the grading that they use, for example, the EORTC criteria is either reducing bleeding or reducing patient symptoms. So eight or seven of the studies they were looking at uh, the grade coming down, which could be bleeding <coughs> or symptoms. Whereas eight of the studies just looked at patient symptom relief. So lots coming in, lots of pain, lots of discomfort. But. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, though. How many of them actually truly stopped bleeding? I don't know the answer to that looking at the 
16. You know, a lot of these patients, even when seeing follow up, then the hematuria may have stopped, but it's still profound storage symptoms. So you're having to be doing anti muscarinics and other treatments uh, because that is a persistent, is a disabling. Yeah, I think if, if, symptoms. if we can reduce the bleeding at least, and we can kind of flip the treatment modality to an acute presentation when they come in with pain and you can treat them with medication and try to control the pain and you know give them different medication in that regard but at least if we take them out of the life-threatening picture of the hemorrhagic picture that we can see sometimes with these patients that come in. So we're to imagine sit around for 30 days treating for changes. Well, they have, they, initially, it's 40 treatment fashion, right, that is automatic, that's covered. But we have one of the doctors from Michael Barracks here. getting the letter to MSP. This, Dave used to always try to go to 60 because he felt that we could have supported that. But to go to 60, you need to get approval. You need approval. Yeah, it's actually, uh, MSP is approved up to 60 now. But, um, you know, just as Sam was pointing out, what we're finding is that the patients that we see earlier in court are within six, six months. Generally, we can stop after even 32 weeks. So we're actually, the end point is clinical response. So if we see that there's been a sustained period of no bleeding and no symptoms, we usually send them back to the urologist to kind of touch base and see if are they happy with the end point, right? And, and if they are, we actually stop earlier. We <coughs> can have a few, few months earlier. We can manage the resource. Uh, whereas I think it's those ones that have had multiple, like sometimes, Kind of fairly destructive therapies, and you catch them later in the course, like kind of like a Hail Mary type of girl, then those ones often need up to 60. But um, medical services can actually now prove to 60, but we try to not do more treatment than somebody needs because it's a fine commitment for us and the patient. Um, just as far as some practical aspects of that, um, you know, the, um, there was a mention about the barrel trauma. So I think that the main side effects that are in the literature and what we see patients get is that 10% of patients experience urethralization difficulties. So during the first 10 minutes, we're increasing atmospheric pressure to 2.4 atmospheres. And uh, so patients have to clear their ears. So the 10% that can't, we actually stop and we take them out. And when we continue, they have to get like two to three by the end. So that's really to actually have somebody suffer barrel trauma is very rare. Ten percent of people don't tolerate exacerbation and that kind of thing. That's fairly common is thirty percent of patients have visual acuity, <coughs> which is a dose related effect that we see with more treatment. So typically after twenty treatments there they get myopia and um, typically once treatment stops it very slowly drifts back to where they really want to be. Outside of those two things, all the other um, contraindications, there is a bit of a screening process, but there are other contraindications. But in the absence of contraindications, any other kind of side effects are fairly rare. So I guess what I'm sort of trying to say is um, we do actually see those type of response numbers that we quoted, like in the 80 to 90 range, but in patients that are earlier, yeah. of course, not ones that it's more of a Dr. Reed, can you go back one slide? Yeah. So seven studies, but one randomized, right? Mm -hmm. So all the other studies are subject to incredible problems, yeah. bias, et cetera. The number of sessions, the increased number of sessions made and predictive outcome is, of course, more perhaps related to <coughs> natural history reasons in those patients. So what, what did the one randomized trial show? That was the one that they compared uh, hyperbarics to hyaluronic acid, yeah. and they found fairly similar outcomes actually in terms of uh, in terms of reducing hematuria and symptoms. So they actually there's no statistical significance in comparing one to the other. But again, those numbers were quite small too. Not very many patients were enrolled. Uh, let me do that one. I don't actually remember that off the top of my head. I can get back to you, but with that, but whenever possible, always show them. Yeah. This is what kind of plagues this feeling, right? And you know, perhaps we should actually be thinking here of actually doing a randomized trial. The numbers are high enough because we just don't know. It's yeah. a very low natural history. And um, after a decade, you don't know. I'd be curious well, to see. Is, there's no standard. Well, no, you do a randomized controlled crossover. So, uh, and there's. 
Yeah, and there's no great uh, randomized control with hyperbarics versus what we commonly do, like hyaluronic acid. I've never seen yeah, us I use. Would say that's a placebo. Yeah. So you, 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 you can lower it. Just because it's very little rationale and data. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, you can talk about the nuances, but you can even do a randomized yeah. uh, best supported care. Right? And then uh, the supported care can be rested across the I think the challenge with these patients is oftentimes they present, they're requiring multiple transfusions, they require multiple take backs, and oftentimes we're trying to do more than one thing at a time. So they're getting their hyperbarics, but they come up, we might be continuing alum with them just so we can hit them with multiple different fronts, and it'd be hard to get a true sense of the outcome. And randomizing them because we're trying, we're just trying everything. So that's stuff. Care, right? so it's, yeah, it's the best supportive care plus or minus. Yeah, fair enough. So we talk about that. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, systemic agents, sodium pentacin polysulfate. Uh, this is a semi-synthetic polysaccharide that serves as a synthetic glycosaminic glycan, and there's an oral for formulation that. Uh, it's, the idea behind it is that it adheres to the bladder mucosa and supplements uh, new essential uh, synthetic glycosin and glycan. And again, significant data is lacking. The largest study was done by Sandu in 1994, and they looked at 60 patients with hemorrhagic cystitis, 53 from radiation, 7 from cyclophosphamide. And um, on average, these patients were seeing uh, the urologist four and a half years after treatment. And they were started on this therapy, 100 milligrams uh, POTID, and they found 10 patients completely responded without any other intervention. Um, not significant, 10 out of 60, but again, it is it, it kind of serves to potentially be a medication that can be used as an adjunct to other things that we're giving. It's, it's fairly safe, side effect profile is quite low, and 10% completely responded. They said that 20 patient, 21 patients reduced the dosing to twice a day because they had improvements. I'm not really sure what that means. They weren't very clear from what I gathered from the paper, but uh, certainly not com a complete loss in terms of uh, potential options. And again, case series show potential reduction of hematuria in treatment. Safe, generally well tolerated, but uh, the slow onset of action, it can take, from the site that they showed, anywhere from one to eight weeks before you see some kind of response. So it's almost like when they come into the door, we should just give it to them and hope it's helping with everything else moving forward. So this is one we deal with, uh, unfortunately, a lot, uh, refractory and life-threatening hematuria. And this is where we see the use of formulin, which is... Um, an aqueous form of a formaldehyde, which was first described in 1969 by Brown and colleagues, who used it on patients with inoperable uh, bladder cancer. They used 10% uh, concentration of formulin, and they found a 90% success rate. Um, hydrolyzes proteins resulting in chemical coagulation of the tissue at the level of the mucosa of the submucosa. But generally, you require an OR, you require GA or spinal, because it can be quite painful for these patients. Now, what concentration you use is varied in literature, and I'm going to touch, about, uh, touch on it very shortly. But uh, typically, the dwell time is 12 to 15 minutes, and you can use 1%, uh, 2%, anywhere from 3 to 6%, or 10% uh, in uh, treatment. And you should always perform a cystogram for these because uh, there's a risk if these patients have reflux or if they have a perforation, it can be very bad news if you give them formula. And so, a cystogram should be done at least at the time of the OR to make sure there's no reflux and no perforation before instilling. Uh, this was a study by Donahue and Frank. It was the largest study to assess for efficacy of formulin uh, from 1989. And it was a systematic review of retrospective studies, and it looked at 123 patients who received treatment with 10% formulin, 91 with 3 to 6% formulin, and 21 with 1 to 2% formulin. And they looked, the complete response was uh, defined as uh, no hematuria after one installation. Partial was those with who had hematuria improved, no longer requiring transfusions, but still needed further treatments. They also looked at minor complications and major complications, minor being not requiring surgical intervention, major being requiring surgery, or if they had a renal tract that was affected. Um, and what they found, they saw complete, complete response within 48 hours of 83% uh, of patients who had the 10%, 78% of patients who had the 3 to 6%, and 71% of patients who had the 1 to 2%. Now, this wasn't statistically significant in their findings, but what was statistically significant is the increase in morbidity and mortality, with 5.7% uh, mortality seen in the 10%, and 2.2% seen the 4 to 6%. So definitely something to keep uh, keep uh, our mind on. And this is actually corroborated by another study in 1993 
uh, by Dewan and colleagues who, again, looked at 35 patients with hemorrhagic cystitis that was non-responsive to CBI and clot evacuations. Nine patients had a mild presentation that defined as gross immature with occasional clot, 16 frequent blood clots, and uh, 10 had severe presentation who were hemodynamically unstable. And what they found is out of the 35, 31 had a complete response within 48 hours, partial seen in three of them. Again, no statistically significant findings when looking at the 1%, the 2%, and the 4% installation in terms of outcome. But what they did find was the complication rates went up as the concentration went up. Uh, there wasn't any particular difference between the 1% and the 2% with respect to complications, but as soon as you jump up to the 4% of formulin, complication rates once again went up. Just very briefly, I'm going to talk about this paper, Lojan Nawapilat, I butchered that name. Um, they basically looked at uh, patients and compared them with receiving 4% intravesical therapy uh, with 10% uh, pledgelets, essentially one by one uh, uh, cotton pledgelets that they put on the focal areas that they saw erythema in. And so this was a way for them to try to avoid bladder toxicity by giving the entire bl bladder exposure to this medication and just looking at individual places that they thought were uh, radiation cystitis induced. And the results, again, very small uh, numbers, 11 in group one, which was the ones that got the 4% and nine in group two, who had the 10% concentrated uh, cotton uh, pledges. And the results were somewhat reassuring. Nine out of the 11 were re responded in group one and six out of eight responded in group two. And there were significantly less uh, complications seen in the group that just had focal treatment of uh, formulin uh, rather than a diffuse intravesical therapy. A small study, but it's actually worth something considering moving forward with these patients. So due to significant morbidity associated with the procedure, formulin installations should be considered in those who failed uh, less invasive procedures. But if it is necessary, we should make sure to prevent reflux and the patients require careful monitoring for side effects moving forward. Now, embolization is an option for these patients that are failing uh, all the other modalities I talked about. And typically, we, it's a safe and tolerable alternative in select patients, particularly older, frail patients who won't tolerate larger uh, procedures. But you require, the, you require an interventional radiologist. You require to have the appropriate uh, resources. And typically, we see internal iliac arteries that are embolized. There's some studies that look at selective uh, or quite selective embolization of the anterior branch to avoid uh, affecting the gluteal artery to pre prevent uh, uh, essentially pain in your buttocks. And the, again, the data is not great in terms of how many, pa how many studies have been done. There was a study in 2010 by Ligori who looked at 44 patients uh, with intractable hematuria. And they found that, uh, again, not significant findings. They found originally there was an 82% initial response, but when they looked back at these patients in follow-up, only 43% had uh, completely stopped having any hematuria. So it's a pretty, it's a invasive procedure and the data isn't strong to support it. But again, when we fail multiple different modalities, sometimes it's one that you almost have to try to hope for the benefit of. So it could be a viable option for these patients who less invasive methods have been unsuccessful in. And it should be truly given to selective and super, and you should try to do selective, super selective embolization to really uh, go after the arteries that uh, you think will make the difference and not cause further side effects. So this is the this is a definitive treatment. If you if patients are not responding to anything, cystectomy is a definitive treatment. But the reason I'm highlighting this paper and the one following is to highlight the side effect profile of these patients that undergo a cystectomy. Obviously. Uh, it's generally the last resort. These patients have gone, undergone uh, radiation. They have fibrosis, obliteration of tissue, so it's already technically more difficult. Uh, this study looked at 21 patients over 12 years at the Mayo Clinic, retrospectively, who had failed other modal modalities. Um, and what they found, and something to note with these patients, they weren't particularly healthy patients either. 15 of the 21 had an ASA grade of 3 and greater. Uh, 18 of the patients had ileal conduits created, two had uh, transverse colon conduits. And they found clavian three to five uh, complications were seen in 42% of patients, and the 90-day all-cause mortality was 16% of the patients that underwent a diversion. And one in three-year survival was 84% and 52%, so obviously they stopped having hematuria, but they had multiple other complications uh, moving forward. And mortality rates significantly went up, and you can see the rates as uh, the years following cystectomy were followed, the uh, overall survival went down significantly as well.
And this was again corroborated by another study by Bassett in 2017 that looked at 100 eligible men in multi-institutional study who underwent urinary diversion. And again, clavian grade 3A or greater complications occurred within 90 days in 31% or 36% of men. Um, Short-term complications, basically walking at patients within six weeks after the treatment, they found that 93 men, um, they followed 93 men, and 35% of them were readmitted for post-operative complications. And long-term, when they followed 85 patients, because four had passed away, 11 were lost to follow-up, uh, 19 of them, 22%, underwent 27 further surgeries for post-operative complications. Nephrostomy tubes are certainly uh, less morbid, they're an option, but very, very limited data. The idea behind it is you're diverting the urine from the bladder to avoid over distension, hopefully stable clots form and self-tamponade. The largest data I could find that was effective was about six patients and three of them completely stopped. Two had ongoing, uh, two had improvement and one had ongoing hematuria. We actually had one patient here at VGH who we did nephrostomy to the patient that all the residents are very familiar with and he actually responded quite well to the nephrostomy tube and conversion to internal externals moving forward. So diversion with or without cystectomy should be reserved only for those who have failed previous therapy and clinicians and patients should be aware of the high morb morbidity and mortality rates of these uh, procedures before surgery. So that leads to my conclusion. So history physical exam, appropriate workup for hematuria should be done uh, for every patient that comes in. So we've got to make sure that we're not missing something. We're not just assuming that it's radiation that's causing or cyclophosphamide that's causing it. This could be something else that's presenting. And uh, because of that, I think cystoscopy is something we should do early, not just for diagnostic purposes, but we, I also touched on the study that showed the clot evacuation itself can be effective in patients. And as good as the residents are at clot evacuation at the bedside, we're not as good as a tumor syringe. So if we can get them in earlier on, I think the outcomes for the patients will be better. And we touched on this, uh, hyperbaric should be, is beneficial and it's uh, something that we should try to initiate as soon as possible. Obviously, we're constrained by the restraints, as uh, was mentioned, it's a three-month wait, so it's not something that we can just get them in the next day of, but the earlier we can initiate the process, the better for these patients. And a lot of these patients require multiple treatment options, and sometimes we have to really consider if one thing is not working by day two, day three, sometimes we continue it and we add something else. But we got to be, I think, a little bit more aggressive in our treatment planning and not just hoping that uh, the CBI will fix everything. And urinary diversion, uh, it could be the gold standard, particularly if you do a cystectomy, but high morbidity and mortality rates are associated with it. And simply put, as Dr. Wee mentioned too, we need more literature, we need more randomized data, we need more uh, definitive, more good literature. Um, Good or literature. Good or, we, good or literature. Or Residency projects. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks.